how would you, you help you with that design? How would you help with that design? You first, first, first. How would you help with that design? Well, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. A few days ago I was talking to one of my most reliable and long-standing moderators, who also happens to be a patron. That is Maya. The topic of plesiosaurs came up, specifically why they are not dinosaurs. So I have decided that plesiosaurs will be the subject of the first episode of a new irregular series called Things That Aren't Dinosaurs, where I will profile extinct animals that are sometimes thought of as dinosaurs, but that aren't. Okay, so what's a plesiosaur? Well, plesiosaurs were a group of marine reptiles that lived from the late Triassic all the way up to the end of the Cretaceous, which means that more or less they were around from the same amount of time as the non-avian dinosaurs. It's not entirely clear what group of reptiles plesiosaurs are most closely related to, but there are some reasons to think that they are archosauromorphs, especially their teeth. Like archosaurs, plesiosaur teeth are set in sockets. Plesiosaurs are a part of a larger group of marine reptiles called sauropterygians. Before the Jurassic, there were several groups of sauropterygians, such as placodonts, nothosaurs, and others. All but the plesiosaurs went extinct during the end Triassic extinction. As a side note, it's not really known what caused this extinction, and since it was before even my time, I can't really say what caused it either. But their skulls are a bit unusual. They only have superior temporal foramen, unlike most basal diapses, which have both superior and inferior temporal foramina. Also, they do not have an antorbital fenestra like archosaurs. Really though, as weird as plesiosaur heads are, the rest of them is even crazier. Let's start with the torso. It's flattened and broad, with a very well-developed gastralia, or belly ribs. Both the pectoral and pelvic girdle are composed of huge plates of bone supporting muscle attachment sites that powered back and downstrokes on the limbs. Finally, unlike most other marine tetrapods, such as ichthyosaurs, mosasaurs, sea snakes, thalatosuchians, and cetaceans, the limbs are used for propulsion, which is like what's done in sea turtles, pinnipeds, and penguins. However, unlike all of these animals, both the fore and hind limbs are about the same size, and it seems like all four of them were powerfully muscled and used in propulsion. In sea turtles, pinnipeds, and penguins, the forelimbs give the propulsive force, while the hindlimbs are used to help stabilize and steer the animal. The forelimbs and hindlimbs are nearly identical, with both knee and elbow joints being immobile, and the radius, ulna, fibula, tibia, humerus, and femur all being broad and flattened, with the neutral pose for all limbs being more or less sticking straight out from the side of the body. The finger and toe bones are relatively small, but each finger or toe has many of them, in some cases up to 16 finger bones. This would have meant that the flippers would only have been flexible at the shoulder and hip joints, and distally at the fingers and toes. This makes plesiosaur limbs like a strange combination of sea turtle and penguin flippers. The flippers are very flexible at the point of the digits, like a sea turtle, but very stiff at the elbows and knees, like the flippers of a penguin. So of course, I've seen plesiosaurs swim back in my younger days, but I don't want to spoil the fun for paleontologists trying to figure it out. As a result, there is much debate as to how the animal used their flippers. The two main questions are what kind of gait was used and how each flipper moved through the water. The two main ideas for flipper motion are that it was either a figure eight, like most bird wing motion, or it was a rowing motion. Currently, the consensus is favoring the rowing motion based on studies regarding the range of motion of the limbs. Still though, this is far from a firm conclusion. The other question is whether all four limbs moved together or whether they had a phase offset. Nearly all possible phase offsets have been considered, although most proposals seem to assume synchronous motion or a relatively small offset. It is also possible that at different speeds the phase offset between the limbs changed. One recent paper proposed a synchronous modified rowing mechanism. I'm not endorsing this view in particular, but it certainly gets rid of some of the problems of other synchronous gait proposals. However, it requires a high degree of mobility of the hind limbs that may not be particularly likely. Unlike most marine reptiles, plesiosaurs have short tails that don't seem to have had any part in the propulsion of the animals. Instead, the most commonly hypothesized use for the tail was as a stabilizer, and that it may have helped somewhat in steering. There are a couple more aspects of plesiosaur anatomy I want to touch on. Namely, their ears and their skin. While many reconstructions show plesiosaurs with scaly skin resembling that of a crocodile, there are in fact preserved skin impressions from the animals that show relatively smooth, scaleless skin with only small wrinkles in it. This was most likely an adaptation to keeping drag on the body down, similar to how whales have lost virtually all of their hair, only having a few whisker-like bristles as newborns and losing even those by the time they mature. With the ear bones, we have an odd situation. While hearing is highly developed in whales, in plesiosaurs it is very much atrophied. In some plesiosaurs, the stapes seem to have been lost altogether. It is likely that many of them were nearly deaf, but all of them could smell and see well, with nasal passages adapted to allow water to flow into them 
where they most likely could pick up waterborne scents, something that, as far as I know, no other marine amniote has ever managed to do. Plesiosaurs came in two main body types. One is short necks and large head, and the other is long neck and small head. At one time it was thought that these two body shapes represented different clades, but current thinking is that the short neck is probably the basal condition for plesiosaurs, and that long necks may have evolved a few times convergently. Long neck plesiosaurs hold the record for the most known cervical vertebrae in any animal, coming in at up to 76. Despite the fact that the two body shapes don't likely represent natural groups, it is still useful to be able to refer to them separately, and so the long necked plesiosaurs are called plesiosauromorphs, and the short necked ones are called pliosauromorphs. Plesiosauromorphs probably fed on small to medium sized fish and mollusks. It was once thought that plesiosauromorphs had very flexible necks that could curve into a swan like pose, but it is now known that each vertebra in the neck had only a very little vertical movement and a bit more horizontal movement, making the neck rather stiff overall. They couldn't put their necks into a swan like pose or a snake like coil. Pliosauromorphs probably fed on larger prey, such as sharks, large fish, and other marine reptiles. Plesiosauromorphs may look like the sea monsters of legend, but the real terrors of the Mesozoic were the Pliosauromorphs. Some Pliosauromorphs, such as Kronosaurus, were so large they could swallow a T Rex in a couple bites. Plesiosaurs have the distinction of being among the first described fossils. Confirmed plesiosaur remains were described as early as 1605. Although at the time, the fossils, which were just a few vertebrae, were thought to be fish. It wouldn't be until 1821, however, that the first plesiosaur genus was named, that being Plesiosaurus. Plesiosaurus, along with pterosaurs, were really the first animals that kicked off modern paleontology. It was these animals that alerted the scientific community that there were extinct animals that were unlike anything alive now. I'd also like to take the time to mention Mary Anning, who could be considered one of the founders of paleontology. She found a very complete plesiosaurus specimen in 1823 that greatly added to the understanding of these animals. Mary also discovered one of the best ichthyosaur fossils, and the holotype for Dimetrodon. Unfortunately, at the time, the scientific establishment was not willing to acknowledge her work, and so she was excluded from joining or even visiting the meetings of scientific bodies, and the members of such bodies only rarely bothered to acknowledge her help or expertise. Fortunately, in the second half of the 20th century, her contributions were more widely acknowledged, and she is now widely seen in paleontological societies as one of the most important paleontologists in history. Well, that's about it for my first episode of Things That Aren't Dinosaurs. I'm not sure what the next one will be about, or when it will be out, but if you have such suggestions, put them in the comments and I will take such suggestions into account. Thanks for watching. Before you go, I'd like to take a minute to thank my patrons, especially my $20 patrons, Ben Tovind, Bob Knob, the Evil Scotsman, Henry Hutanen, Chris Love, and Res Instance. If you'd like to help me make videos like this, why don't you head over to my Patreon? I have tiers starting as low as $1 and going all the way up to $100. You'll get access to my Discord, as well as some other exclusive items that only my patrons get to see. You'll also occasionally get early access to my videos. If a monthly subscription isn't right for you, but you'd still like to help out, you can check out my merch store or my Amazon.com wishlist, both of which are linked in the description. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. You first, first, first. How would you decide? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know.